Hey, thank you so much. Am I, did I get my mic on and everything? Okay. All right. Good, good to be here with you today. Good morning to you, and this is one of my favorite places to come and preach. I've been here a number of times. Brother Johnny invites me about once a year, and I think that's about all you could take of me, about once a year. So he invites me once a year. But I appreciate him doing this for me, and we hope that they have, they have a great trip wherever they are today. And uh, just good to be with you. Uh, did you, uh, I've got two, my wife said, now Ben, don't tell any of your corny jokes. And she's heard all my jokes. And, and, uh, but I heard this the other day, and I, I'm sure you know about this. Do you know what it takes to be a Baptist? You know what it takes to be a Baptist, okay? I didn't know this the other day. Number one, of course I knew this, you've got to believe in Jesus, okay? That's number one. Number two, your wife has got to have a 9 by 13 pan uh, for casseroles. And that makes you a Baptist, okay? I'll be going to Israel again uh, in about a couple of months, less than a couple of months. It'll be my 11th time. And I don't like to fly. I don't know if you do or not. I cannot stand to fly, but I just have to grit my teeth. And I asked my doctor, I said, give me two sleeping pills. One going over, one coming back. Because I don't like to fly. I'm nervous all the time I'm flying. But uh, I heard something the other day that kind of interested me uh, about uh, flying. This man was taking his mother with him on a trip. And his mother was an old-time Baptist woman, a Bible-thumping Baptist woman that really didn't talk to you about Jesus. No matter where you were, whatever you're doing, she always ended up talking to you about Jesus. And so when they got on the plane and the son said to his mom, said, now, Mom, he said, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Don't talk to anyone about Jesus. That's all you do. When you get on an airplane, wherever you're going, you, saw, you say something about Jesus. So don't talk about Jesus all the time. She, she said, okay, um, I, I won't do that. She said, I'll tell you what, if they don't mention anything religious, I'll not talk to them about Jesus. But if they, you know, if they mention something about Jesus, then I, you know, I may do something else. And, but he said, he said, now, Mom, don't talk to them about Jesus. She said, well, I won't unless they bring up something about Jesus. So they got on the airplane, and his mom was sitting across the aisle from on the aisle seat, and he's over here. And this guy came, comes in and comes walking down the aisle and uh, looks at his seat. And this guy, he said, I looked at him and said, no, don't sit by me. And so he goes over and to his mother and says, uh, is this seat saved? <laughs> that started the conversation, didn't it? Is this seat saved? Well, today... We want to talk about, is this seed saved? Well, I, I'm glad to be here with you today. So take your Bibles today. And, uh, you know, when you get to be my age, sometimes we'll say, well, uh, you get tired easily. Well, I was to see my doctor a few months ago and get my physical. And I'm going on eight years old. And so uh, he said to me, he said, well, you're in pretty good shape uh, for a guy almost 88 years old. And I said, well, if I appreciate that. But he, he said, do you get tired? I said, well, I get up about 6 o'clock every day. And uh, I get home about 6 in the evening. And um, I go to bed about 10. And I said, sometimes I'm a little tired after that day. And he said, he's a young guy. And he said, so am I at that kind of schedule. But anyway, my sermon title today is So Tired. So tired. I want you to listen to that for a moment with me. So tired. Turn your Bible to Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. You've heard this story many, many times, but I want to read it to you today. It's in the prayer in the garden, all right? Listen to what he says. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I... Go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, 
if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Never had the sun risen on such a day as I just read to you. No other time. That ball of fire that's up in the air we call the sun. We call it a ball of gases. Had, if it had a mind of its own, I doubt if it had even shone that day into the city of Jerusalem. It would have stayed hidden somewhere in outer space and would not have shone at all. Far as, as I'm concerned, as we look at this, we begin to understand what was happening here on this day. For this day of days, and I call it the day of days, the Prince of Glory was to be crucified. On this day, the bright and morning star was going to be crucified. On this day, the lily of the valley was going to be crucified. The Son of God was going to be crucified and would be raised between heaven and earth on a Roman cross on this day. It was on this day that the fountain of divine blood would be poured forth upon the ground and around the cross and the ultimate lamb would be killed for the salvation of the world. That was this day that we're talking about in the Garden of Gethsemane. But on these hours before the light of day, the lamb himself, Jesus Christ, led 11 men through the Kedron Valley and if you go to Israel, and if you've seen pictures, you see it often of the great golden dome, that's a Muslim dome. But in front of that is, of course, the western wall, the great wall. And then down you go down the hill, and it is the Kedron Valley. And you go up the other side, and you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not very far, but farther than it looks because of the great ravine into the Kedron Valley. And I thought maybe one, as I thought about that, what Jesus, as he walked across the Kedron Valley, Maybe enter into his mind Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Behind our Lord's shoulders as he walks, it was the great wall there. Hiding the hill that would be, he would be crucified on a few hours later. It's called Calvary or Golgotha. Now let me explain something to you, and I don't know you've heard it before. There's a difference in Calvary and Golgotha in the scriptures because Calvary is inside the walls of Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us and the history tells us and Josephus the historian tells us that they never baptized, excuse me, they never crucified inside the walls. Alibi, General Alibi, the English general found outside that wall the place of the skull. You've seen that in a rock. It looks like a skull. That's called Golgotha. And I believe that's where Jesus was crucified, outside those walls at Golgotha. And the hills of Calvary and the hills of Golgotha, you can call it either one. It's not wrong to do that. But listen, Golgotha is where they would hang him upon the tree and he would die there. Now he steps forward with his leaders, takes his leaders with him into the grove of olive trees known as Gethsemane. The garden was about at the foot of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives down the hill to the Mount of Olives, down to Gethsemane. The actually name in the Hebrew for the Gethsemane is meaning 
of a press, an oil press. And of course the oil would be made from the olive trees. A few hours before this, Jesus had broken bread with his disciples in the upper room. He told them of his coming crucifixion or his coming death. They were shocked. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted him to live on and they wanted him to overtake and overcome the Roman government, to set up a kingdom upon this earth. But that's not what he came for. His kingdom is in heaven, not upon this earth. But they wanted him here on this earth. And those 12 men will come along with him and Judas had vanished in the night, was not with him at this time. And immediately he was the betrayer. The trauma was just beginning now. Their hearts had been humbled. Jesus had put a towel around his waist. I want you to try to imagine this, if you would. The King of kings, the glory uh, of God, the power of God, the holiness of God, all that in Jesus Christ. He was God-man. And he comes down and he wraps a towel around his waist and he washes the feet of the disciples. Now, you may say, well, Brother Ben doesn't need to be a Baptist, but I don't think it's wrong to wash feet in the church. I really don't. I really do not believe that because it shows humbleness. It shows servanthood. And we need that today. A lot of us don't want to ever be a servant. But Jesus became the God of God, the lily of the valley, became a servant and washed the feet of people. Can you imagine in all of His power, in all of His glory, here is God-man washing the feet of fishermen, washing the feet of everyday individuals. He was a servant. And one of the greatest things you'll ever do, church members, is to be a servant of God. Just be a servant. You don't have to be anything else. People ask me sometimes, Brother Ben, do you ever feel like you were a CP, uh, that you were a, a, a kind of a, a guy that's ahead of everything? And Did you ever think that you were very important? Did you ever feel that way at all? No, I've never felt that way in my whole lifetime. There's a lot of things wrong with me, but I've never felt like that. I've always in my whole life felt like I'm just a servant of God. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a CEO. Some preachers want to be CEOs. I'm not a CEO. I'm a pastor and I'm a servant of God. And the greatest thing you can be is a servant of God. Just say, I want to serve God. Jesus washed the feet of these people with, 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 he was with. And my, what a servant he must have been. The master, the son of God, becoming no more than a servant. I come to the garden alone where the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the son of God declares, I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. My folks, every day I share with him in my prayer time. So precious. He walks with me and he talks with me. Even though I'm just an everyday individual. He does that with you. You are a servant of God. Be a servant. Don't try to be anything but what God wants you to be. Now just for a few moments, I want us to spotlight these three men that were with him. Peter, James, and John. They were very special men. These three men were very close to the Savior. I don't understand that, but it's like all of us. We have closer friends than others. Now, we say, I don't have favoritism. That's good for pastors not to have favoritism. But listen, all of us have close friends. And they were with Jesus, Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus stopped the three beneath the ancient olive trees. Now, I know you know this probably, but have you heard preachers preach and teachers teach. Olive trees never really die. Did you know that? They, uh, there's trees in the Garden of Gethsemane that's over 2,000 years old. If you notice, they, they look like they're dead, but all of a sudden, they sprout new things coming out of them. And so they just keep coming over and over again. And they say they, they rebirth, they come back again. Well, he, here he was with them, and he sits them beneath the olive tree for a moment. He says, stay right here for just a few moments. And over in the corner of the Garden of Gethsemane, outside they have most of it walled off now with a little fence so you can't take parts of the olive trees. 
and so is a big, huge rock. And I thought to myself, maybe, now listen to what I said, I said maybe, maybe that's where Jesus went to pray. Went over there and knelt down by that uh, big, uh, big rock. But the, he said to the disciples, you stay right here, watch him pray with me. Then our Lord went a few steps farther into the garden where he began to pray in anguish of spirit. Now I want you to listen to that word, anguish of spirit. Christ said that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Sorrowful unto death. This sorrow was almost death. That's what it meant. He almost died in the garden of Gethsemane on his knees. You say, I never heard that before. Well, listen, folks, that's what the Bible says. The anguish there, the exceeding sorrowful unto death, meant almost died praying there in the garden. It would be more, mere hours now before his body would be nailed to the Roman cross. Just a few hours now. And the sins of the whole world would cover him like a raw, open sore of death plague. Just like a raw sore pressing down upon him. Every sin Ben Raul has ever committed, every bad word I've ever said in my lifetime, every bad thought that I've ever had in my lifetime, every sin that I committed in my life, the sins of omission even that I committed. Listen, all those sins were poured out upon him. All of your sins were poured out on Jesus that day. Think about that a moment. Could you take that load of all the sins of all the world, of all the people that ever lived, and put them up on your shoulders? You say, I couldn't do that. None of us could, but the Son of God could. And every sin that's ever been committed, that you have committed, I have committed, is put on His shoulders right then, and it was pushing down upon Him at that moment. The sorrow was almost unto death. It was so great. It would be mere hours. And he'd die for you and me. If these three men had an opportunity of witnessing eternities, they had it. Now listen to me. No other three men ever had such an opportunity to witness the anguish of the heart of God. They missed that because they were too tired. They went to sleep. They went to sleep. They didn't, miss, they didn't see that at all, the anguish of him at that moment. To view redemption, a fallen man by human eyes, it was now for them. But they missed that at that time. Christ had taken them into the inner chamber, the closest thing to him. He was so close to them. Unto the very council of the halls of heaven, God took those men that day. And all three fell asleep. They were too tired. Peter, James, and John could have witnessed earth's greatest prayer meeting. I want to say that to you again. Peter, James, and John could have witnessed the greatest prayer meeting that was ever held, but they missed it because they were asleep. Better yet, they could have participated in the greatest prayer meeting that was ever held, and they missed that. Isn't that a shame? You say, oh, I would have done that. Well, we probably would have because we'd have been tired too, but they missed it all. Bidden to stop uh, at that moment uh, under a tree for a few moments they said I will just wait right here but they could not stand it they were too tired so they went to sleep there's not a pastor in the world today that I've ever met that hadn't had some of his church members too tired to pray just too tired to come and pray people ask me all the time said all the years you pastored 68 years now uh, what, why do you think we don't have revivals like we used to have revivals well, one thing, we don't even call them that anymore. You know, we're afraid to. We say, people won't come to a revival. Well, one of the reasons they don't come because we haven't prayed for revival. We're not on our faces before God, asking God to help us. Because you see, people, there is uh, all around us people today that are headed for hell, and we're not praying for them. We're not praying for them anymore. I, it's been a long time since I've met somebody at the altar and they'll say to me, I want to pray for my husband that's lost, or my wife that is lost, my son that's lost, my, my cousin that's lost, my neighbor that's lost. I want to pray for them because they're lost and on the way to hell, and, and I can't stand for them to go there. I want them to go to heaven with me. And so it's been a long time since I've had somebody say, 
pray for me, preacher, like that. We pray about everything else, but we're not praying for the lost, my friends, at all. Great revivals will not come because we build great churches. Buildings, I'm talking about now. We can even have revivals without a church building. Did you know that? But it's good to have good buildings. We have great buildings. I'm proud of the buildings we have. This is a great facility you have, great facility where I pastor, uh, associate pastor, great church uh, buildings where I pastor for years and years. But listen, buildings won't do that at all. A charismatic evangelist won't do it. You can bring in the greatest evangelist in the whole world, and he won't bring revival in, into us at all. We could reach the world without buildings. We could reach the world without evangelists. Yet revival will not, come because, will not come because we're not called on our knees to pray to God, to ask God for revival to come our way. Now, revival won't come because some uh, Jehu, and I'm going to call him that, I, I don't care how many offend you, that got on television and national news and said, I want to buy a new jet airplane, and I've got two already but they won't fly me around the world. I want a, I want a jet airplane that I don't have to refuel and, and uh, so I can go around the world. Folks, that's as dumb as a fist fight in an outhouse. Listen, listen, folks, listen. Those people are dumb. Their elevator don't go to the top. And you say, well, there's, a pe- there's lights on, but nobody's home. I really believe that about some of these guys. But listen, revival won't come because we have that kind of individuals. Revival will come. Victorious revival will come when we fall on our faces before God and we're not too tired to spend time praying to God. I may have told you this before. I've been here a number of times. But in my very first church, I was 19 years old. I was so dumb. Listen, uh, I look back now. Those people must be saints of God because they put up with me. My wife was 16. Can you imagine your your pastor being 19 and his wife 16. Well, that's well how we started in my, my, very, my very first church. And we had a revival. Brother Cisco was the guy that preached our revival. I can remember that. So we had this great revival. But the first five nights of the revival, nothing happened. I mean, nothing. Just uh, in my little congregation, we ran about, at that time we were in about 75 people. And we'd have about 60 people there. But on a Thursday night, it was Thursday night or Friday night. On Thursday or Friday night, for some, for some reason, I'll tell you why in a moment, there, the house was full and we didn't have air conditioning then. We had the windows raised and there were more people outside the church than inside. They couldn't get in. I've, I've asked the Lord many times through the last few years, oh Lord, let me have a day when we ter- have to turn people away. To say, we don't have any room in here anymore. You can't come in. Wouldn't that be a great day? But listen, we, we uh, had this huge crowd. Well, let me back up and tell you why. Every night before the revival started, the men would go out in a cotton field, out in the middle of a cotton field. We'd get on our knees. Mosquitoes about to carry us away. We'd get on our knees and we'd pray. We'd sweat. We'd get up the mud on the knees of our pants as we'd get up. We stayed out there and prayed so long. The women prayed in a room in the corner of the little church. The teenagers were in another little corner, and the boys and girls were in another little corner. We prayed, and we prayed so hard, and we asked God to send revival. And that night, that many people came to, uh, to that congregation, outside and inside, more than we could take. And people were saved, gloriously saved. And the leading gambler on the Mississippi River and the, in the boot hill of Missouri was saved that night. Johnny Thompson was his name. He was gloriously saved. He comes running through the doors, running down the aisle. I thought he was coming to kill me, folks. I really did. He was coming running down the aisle. He fell on his face to the front, and his little granddaughter had just been saved. And Johnny Thompson looked up to heaven and said, God, if you can save my little granddaughter, can you save me? And he was saved right there. God sent revival. And let me tell you what happened. This I think I've told you before. In our church, we had three lights down this side, three lights down this side, and one over the pulpit. Just a little bulb that you screwed in like this, and it stuck up like that. Just three down this side, three down that side, and one over the pulpit. I had 20 20 vision then. I had a hard time at night reading the scripture. It was so duh, dim in our church, kind of dark looking in the church. But all of a sudden, when Johnny Thompson raised his hands to God and was saved, the room illuminated. Now listen to me. I'm not Pentecostal now, 
but I'm almost Pentecostal, okay? The room illuminated, got bright. He said, how long, preacher? Maybe five seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, maybe that, about that long. I didn't say a word to anyone. We were on the invitation. Many people were saved that night, glorious revival. The next day I met one of my deacons, Brother Abbott, at the store in town, and I said, uh, Brother Abbott, did you see anything different last night in the service? He said, yes, I did. And I said, what was it? He said, you tell me first. And I said, did the room illuminate? And he said, yes, Brother Ben, it did. He said, I've never seen anything like that in my whole lifetime. What happened, folks? The power of God came down. Listen, in prayer, it'll happen. The world is in sin today. And Jesus said, I'll take all your sins. Crushed in upon him. They pushed on him and he was gloriously uh, on the cross for you and for me. The bitter cup of sin was put to his lips to save us and to bring salvation into our lives. There's a great, great old time preacher. I got lots of his books called G. Kimball Morgan. He told a story uh, uh, on one occasion uh, during the Welch revivals. And many of you wouldn't know about that, but the history of revivals, the Welch revivals, one of the greatest revivals ever. A minister said to have written a sermon that every time he preached it, people came to know Jesus Christ. Literally hundreds came to know Christ. Every time that preacher would preach that sermon, they'd ask him to go around to a different church, he'd preach the same sermon. And every time, many, many, many people would be saved. Literally hundreds came to know Christ. Far away in another valley was a preacher who heard about that. So he made a long trip to this preacher's home, a little old shack of a home, set beside the road, and he goes in and, tells this preacher who he is and said, I've come to ask you, where did you get that sermon that's bringing so many people to Jesus? And the man said, come here, I'll show you. Took him into a little room and there's a little rug in the middle of the floor and it was threadbare. That rug would be threadbare. He'd been on his knees there praying. He said, right there, looking out that window, praying every day. And he said, not long ago, not long ago, I got on my knees there at the start of the evening. I prayed at midnight. I was still praying. Nothing came to me. I prayed on to 3 o'clock. Nothing came. I prayed on to 4 o'clock in the morning. Nothing came. But all of a sudden, he said, I looked out that window as I was praying, and there was a little bit of a gray spot out there where the sun was getting ready to come up. It turned to purple. It turned to different colors, and, and then the sunrise came. And just at sunrise, as I was praying, the sermon came. And I've preached it. And every time I've preached it, hundreds have come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. How long has it been since you spent time in prayer? Let me ask you, families, how long, rather than just saying, God bless our food, and we need to do that all, always, bless our food, but how long has it been since you spent time on your knees as a family praying? Husbands, how long has it been since you got on your face before God, prayed for your wife and your kids and your grandkids and your loved ones and your church? How long has it been, men, since you've done that? Ladies, how long has it been since you put the dish rags down or, and put, put the uh, towels down and put the rugs down or, and put away the vacuum cleaner and got on your knees and said, Oh, God, I come to you today, not for myself. I'm coming to you for somebody else that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We're playing church, church. Not a praying church, we're playing church. We need to be a praying church. Thank God there are prayer warriors out there. I remember Rogers First Baptist, I was there 26 years. And every time I got sick or every time I had a need, I'd call these two sisters. Now, some of you may have known them. They were called the Shipman Sisters. Uh, they'd never been married. Two sisters, never been married. And uh, they wore, ladies, they wore, now we wear, wear long dresses. My wife does. And I notice these ladies up here, some of them had long dresses on today. And they wore long dresses. Their ha hair was in a bun. They looked like what we kind of classify, and I'm not being mean about this, like the Pentecostal ladies look. But I'd call them, and I'd say, ladies, I need your prayers. And I'd tell them why. And immediately when I'd hang up, I knew 
that they were on their knees praying for me of whatever need we had. Prayer warriors. How about being a prayer warrior for Jesus? Get on your knees before him. Now, we're out in the garden again, and that happened three times to those men. Three times they had an opportunity. You see, there's no shortcut to the power of God. Just prayer. And Calvary could have never been without Gethsemane. The victory was won in Gethsemane on his knees. Bow your heads, please, with me for a moment. Every head is bowed.